Hey everybody, welcome to Baker Creek again. This is Matt Powers coming to you live. I'm outside today. <laughs> As you can see, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful January day. We've got uh, people everywhere doing things everywhere right now. Um, setting up for a huge spring and summer. We've got greenhouses and ponds going in. We've got beds that are being prepared. We've got areas that are irrigation are getting put in. So lots of things are happening here at Baker Creek. And I just wanted to kind of, you know, come from a different perspective today because uh, we've been inside in the uh, theater for a while. Um, you can see uh, people leaving from, uh, from working in the, the restaurant from our lunches. Um, and those are, those are open every weekday uh, to people coming in. And we're, uh, we're, we're making plans. We're discussing our spring. We're discussing the Heirloom Expo. We're pl planning the Spring Planting Festival. Uh, we're talking about uh, new varieties. You guys are writing us. We're answering your questions. And I wanted to take a moment today to talk about why heirlooms and what are heirlooms? Because a lot of people don't really know what that means. Um, just like people don't know what hybrid means or what GMO means. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of go through that with you guys and uh, make it understandable. So um, to start off with, uh, a hybrid is an unstable cross. And so it's something that will express itself a certain way and then will show its, its, its complexity of inheritance. And so what will happen is you save seed from that hybrid and you plant it and then, ha, you get all these crazy things that start because it's showing all the variation within its heritage. And so it's unstable. It's not true to seed. And so open pollinated plants are plants that uh, are, are, are allowed to just pollinate without anyone hand pollinating or controlling it. And um, they're, they grow true to seed. And those are what we call heirlooms. Obviously, there's there's people with stricter definitions for heirlooms where it needs to be a certain uh, year or a certain uh, number of generations that uh, it's, it's, it's been passed through. Um, but we're just doing true to seed, open pollinated as our definition for what heirloom is here at Baker Creek. And so why are these things important? Uh, what, you know, uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, why is hybrid different from GMO? GMOs are, are genetically modified organisms that either have had their genes combined manually in a laboratory setting from what they are to something new. And usually that involves uh, genes from other animals and, uh, and other plants. And that concept is based around this idea that you can take a gene from something else and have the expression of that gene remain the same when you move it. But that's based on the idea that genes have a set phenotypic expression. And that's just not true at all. They, every gene has a spectrum of expression within it, a phenotypic expression, if you remember biology class in high school. And so when we move genes around, we're moving around bundles of interactions and behaviors that have a syntax that ties into the whole genetic um, sequence and the whole genetic strand. So it's really important to realize that that's what's different between hybrids, uh, heirlooms, and GMOs. All right, so now uh, land races are really where we started with um, getting all these heirlooms. And so uh, land races are collections of, of, of genetic expression. So you'll have a land race of beans. There'll be small beans, big beans, different color beans, uh, early, late, you know, um, and they'll have this whole collection of expression within them. And because of that, they're like way more like resilient and able to adapt to their, their regions. And so they're absolutely incredible. I love working with land races. Um, we actually sell some land races. We don't call them that. But um, if, you, if you check out our, our, our database, you'll, you'll notice that we have Painted Mountain. And Painted Mountain uh, flower corn is a combination of things. It's a rainbow, you know, it has every color other than green that you can get out of corn. Same thing with uh, glass gem corn. It's complete rainbow, it has the greens in there, right? So it's, it's, it has a variation, a huge variation of expression. And that's what defines it as a land race. And that's what's so incredible about those, uh, those, those types is you can pull things out of them and use them for breeding experiments. So, that's why we had the green glass gem corn 
that's coming down the uh, down the uh, the pipeline towards us. That's why we have Papa's um, Papa's red corn. Uh, yeah, it came out of a selection from a bunch of uh, different land races that got combined. Uh, Carol Depp um, pulled uh, all these different really really interesting uh, seeds out of Painted Mountain corn uh, too, uh, which was bred by Dave Christensen. Um, so. Land races are absolutely incredible. So now that we've got these all defined, why are heirlooms so important? Well, heirlooms are the genetic markers. So we've got these land races, which is like this pool. And we pull these things out of it and stabilize them. And these things are our heirlooms. And, and traditionally, that happened per family. So your family really likes that smaller blue like tomato yeah and that family really likes that amish paste that is the bigger you know, like size and this family really likes the smaller size and then suddenly you've got all these different heirlooms that are per family and so the mitchell family cowpea or the piggott family cowpea you know it, it starts tailoring itself to their garden their site their town their area and so that's really what's going on is that we have all of these families that have been breeding and all of our families did it. All these families are breeding these plants, saving these seeds and creating these individual varieties that are entirely unique. And they're doing this and we've been doing it the entire time. And so what we have now is we have this huge collection of, and, and we've lost a lot of it, true, true. But we have this huge collection of, of germplasm that needs to be carried on by all of us. So we need to do our part uh, to, to preserve this, this amazing heritage of, of, of heirloom genetics. So um, that means that we need to save seeds. It also means that we need to be breeding new varieties because that's what they did. And we also need to be adapting our varieties because that's what they did. And every time we adapt a variety, we're actually creating a new variety. So let's just say, we all buy the same seeds. I buy the same thing that you buy. We all buy it everywhere we are. And then we all grow it. And then we select one or two plants out of that because you harvest the rest and ate them, ate them right? And so you pl uh, pick one or two plants and then grow that. And then you do that for five years. And if we actually went and compared all the different variations we discover that we've created new varieties from that one variety that we were all breeding uh, by just selecting in our own area and that that varies per um, per crop um, some some things really really hold their type and their behavior and they're really hardy and resilient in that way and so they'll be the, basically the, very similar in all these different regions and their performance um, how fast they put on seed, how uh, vigorous, how nutritious, all those kinds of things would be the indicators. Sometimes, though, we'll get different colors. Sometimes we'll get different sizes. Sometimes we'll get um, different growth habits. And we'll get all these different crazy kind of things um, happening. And it's all because of our region, because of our selection. And so the more genetic variability you have going in, the more interesting and more diverse you will have in the selection process um, at the end. So that's, that's part of the reason why we have so much variation because it's all been adapted to our unique areas and to our unique family selections that we've made. Um, another, a, another reason we do heirlooms is they're just more resilient. Uh, GMOs, they require tons of babying. They need to be pouring tons of chemicals all over them. They need to be killing everything around them just so that they can get a yield. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, they're basically bathing in, in money and chemicals. Uh, and they're not getting anywhere profit-wise. They're not getting anywhere nutrition-wise. And uh, we're setting ourselves up for serious crop failure. Um, if you uh, recall history class, the potato famine, uh, the Irish potato famine was caused by the fact that one potato fungus, a blight, um, killed all, uh, there was a huge uh, crop failure because there was only one potato that was being grown and because the food for the British um, was not potatoes, um, they had to give the food that they grew for the British to the British and then the food that they had remaining was the potatoes 
and because they failed that's why there was so much starvation so they did have other crops they were growing they just weren't allowed to eat them um, so we don't want that to happen uh, here in America or globally or worldwide considering that we have six to eight crops that we are only eating and raising on the whole so that's part of the reason why we need heirlooms is uh, when we grow not just one type of corn when we're growing like uh, a dozen types of corn or um, you know a hundred types of corn or 800 types of corn if you're like uh, Stephen Smith um, we have that genetic base to protect ourselves uh, and that can be inside the plant like in a land race situation or it can be in your garden with five six a dozen varieties I think I grew over 20 or 30 different kinds of tomatoes maybe 40 or 50 kinds of tomatoes last year I can't remember um, but but the the point is that we need to have the diversity in there as protection for our health for our gardens for our soil you know for just overall ecological stability so that's another reason why we do heirlooms all right am I missing anything here yeah so without heirlooms we'd also we'd also it, it, it would just be boring I mean we're talking about the difference between like a rainbow where this you know there's thousands of types of food that we don't know about you know that are just waiting to be discovered that are just waiting waiting to be culinarily explored you know in our kitchens and then we've got these six and they're just the same we've had for you know 50 60 years and they're they're, they're all eaten by bugs and they're attacked and they're weak and nutritionally you know they're just devoid of everything and it's like you know what kind of what kind of world do we want to live in do we want to live in a world that is precious that is like an heirloom that we want to pass on to our children in in as pristine condition as we can uh, is something that's irreplaceable something that uh, money can't buy or do we want to pass on a world that's losing its value every year you know so when we plant in our garden we really are planting with intention the kind of world the kind of garden the kind of body the kind of family the kind of future that we want and so when we do that we should always make it heirloom we should always make it a part of our, our tradition and heritage part of what we know is strong and diverse and will protect us and and we we all know these things you know and uh, it just takes talking about it sharing these things doing it in our own lives and uh, you know that's that that's kind of all I wanted to say about heirlooms so here let's check out what what we can see over here all right so uh, you guys have seen the uh, the drones uh, views of everything so this year uh, these two areas that's I, I believe that's called the kitchen garden right there uh, ooh, there well I'm getting better with my arm here yeah right there that's the kitchen garden so that's where most of the food is coming for um, the restaurant. Over there, we did a lot of seeds. Let's see if we can orient there. Over, yeah. Mm, there we go. Over there, we 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 do a lot of seeds over there. But as you know, um, or if you don't know, I should tell you guys, we have farmers and grow and seed growers all over the world. So we don't grow everything here. We try to uh, trial as much as possible as we can here. Um, but not all of our seeds will grow here in Missouri because some of them are tropical. <laughs> like our bananas, you know what I mean? We're not growing them all here. We don't have a, 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 um, a, uh, a tissue culture laboratory here. Uh, we don't have any of those things going yet. But the, what's really interesting about that is people when they call and they're like, well, I'm not growing I'm not in growing in a climate like Missouri How are these seeds gonna be okay and I'd like to reassure you that you know we're growing the seeds where they grow well so um, if it's a, a plant that grows in uh, zone 8 through 10 we're growing it for seed in zone 8 through 10 um, if it's a plant that does well in zone 5 we're growing it in a zone 5 situation because otherwise seed growers really can't get enough seed um, and get good quality seed if they're growing conditions that are so difficult 
This is why you guys, uh, in the more difficult climates, you need to save seed and just buy varieties from us that are new every year and just save seed and uh, don't repeat any buys, you know, because um, we're growing where, where, where uh, these seeds are easy to grow, you know, and that's, that makes perfect sense. Um, what's going on? What's going on? Um, like in my region where I was growing in 140 degree soils, no one's doing seed companies out in the deserts, you know what I mean? So it's up to us to adapt those seeds it's up to us to be the seed savers and the stewards for our local area. So when we do seed saving activities, seed swapping activities, or seed breeding activities, we're actually operating with our biome and our bioregion, and we're creating things that are regionally strong and resilient. And and we also understand that, you know, if we're in one of those edge, edge areas, we're in one of those areas where people aren't really, you know, seed companies aren't operating, um, we understand why, you know, it may take some time to adapt. It may take, you know, a couple of seasons. I, I, I think uh, I mentioned it before, but I had carrots that took uh, two years to uh, start really developing well. These white carrots. And it was because they really had to learn the landscape. All right, well, I'm getting cold. I'm gonna check out what you guys uh, wrote me and I'm gonna write you guys uh, back uh, responses when I go inside. But thank you guys so much for hanging out and I will see you guys hopefully tomorrow.